including those who are watching this as a recording, will be entered into a raffle for a special ACES Aware of Ventura County prize. This lecture is being recorded, so you can have access to it on our website at any time. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Thank you, Dr. Landon, for that uh, welcome. Our speaker today is Dr. Christine Thang. She will be presenting on ACES Science, the Physiology of Toxic Stress. Dr. Christine Thang is a clinical instructor in the Division of General Pediatrics at UCLA. Dr. Thang is board certified, is a board certified pediatrician and member of the faculty practice at the Children's Health Center in Westwood, California. She precepts medical students and resident physicians training in the UCLA Pediatrics Clinic. She is also one of the medical team providers for the UCLA Pediatric Craniofacial Program. Her clinical interests are in well newborn care, craniofacial needs, childhood trauma and resiliency, and healthy lifestyle and nutrition. Dr. Thang and earned her medical degree from the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine with Alpha Omega Alpha Honors. She completed her pediatric training in the UCLA Pediatric Residency Program and was awarded the Excellence in Teaching with Humanism Residents and Fellows Award. After residency, she served as a chief resident and concurrently pursued the David Geffen School of Medicine Medical Education Fellowship. Dr. Thang received her undergraduate degree from UCLA with a major in physiological sciences and minor in Asian American studies, graduating magna cum laude and phi beta kappa. Her professional interests include community pediatrics, advocacy, and medical education. She is actively involved in the American Academy of Pediatrics at the local and national levels. Dr. Thang is dedicated to improving the care of all children and to teaching at the undergraduate and graduate medical education levels. Dr. Thang grew up in Los Angeles. She is a spirited Bruin alumna. After the lecture, Dr. Thang will be responding to some pre-submitted questions as well as audience questions. You are all encouraged to submit questions via the chat box for Dr. Thang to answer during the Q&A session. Now, I'll turn it over to our presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Christine Thang. I am a general pediatrician at the University of California, Los Angeles. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I am here to talk about ACEs science and the physiology of toxic stress. Content for this talk has been adapted from the AAP's Pediatric Approach to Trauma, Treatment, and Resilience, the Patter Project. This project has been funded by an educational grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The principal investigator is Dr. Maura Salaji. For those of you who attended session one with her, you may find some material here to be a refresher. The learning objectives that we'll go over today, our goals for this talk, will be to one, define adverse childhood experiences and their prevalence, health disparities in these data, toxic stress response, and related impacts on health, including underlying biological mechanisms. We'll describe the original adverse childhood experiences study. We will describe toxic stress physiology and related impacts on health, including underlying biological mechanisms and we'll identify variable responses to toxic stress that's dependent on a child's age. So let us begin. Uh, first, we have to talk about that original ACEs study. So that original Adverse Childhood Experiences or ACEs studies comes from the landmark 1998 study that was conducted by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. Over 17,000 adult patients from Southern California were looked at. These patients completed confidential surveys regarding their childhood experiences and current health status and behaviors. Visually, we'll look at the 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. These included abuse, neglect, and the household challenges that you see listed below. From Dr. Anda, co-principal investigator to the original ACEs study, there were some key points to take away. One, ACEs are common. 
Two, ACEs tend to occur in clusters rather than single experiences. The cumulative impact of multiple exposures can be captured in an ACE score. The ACE score likely captures the cumulative neural developmental consequences of traumatic stress. The ACE score has a strong greater relationship to numerous health, social, and behavioral problems throughout a patient's lifespan. From that population-based study, we could see that ACEs dramatically increase the risk for at least nine of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. These include heart disease, cancer, to mental health, including suicide attempts. What we can see is that the association between ACEs and negative health outcomes span the lifespan. So how do ACEs work? Well, adverse childhood experiences occur during a critical time in childhood development with no neurobiological and psychosocial effects. One of the things about ACE screening that's really important to recognize is that the purpose of ACE screening isn't so much to identify the specific ACE per se, but more to recognize that adverse childhood experiences are risk factors for the development of the toxic stress response. It is this toxic stress response that leads to changes in neurobiology, the immune system, the endocrine and metabolic systems, even down to how DNA is transcribed in red. It is this toxic stress response that lets us see those problems that happen down the line from the behavioral to the psychosocial. Currently, there is research underway to identify clinical biomarkers and diagnostic criteria for the toxic stress response. However, these diagnostic criteria currently do not exist. So our best bet is to recognize that it's that cumulative adversity that leads to the toxic stress response. Having an understanding that cumulative adversity leads to this toxic stress response helps us intervene in a patient early on in their life course. So next we have to understand, well, well what is stress then that makes it toxic? That first involves understanding that there are different levels of stress. From the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, we have this conceptual taxonomy comprising three distinct types of the stress response. We'll start off on one end in the green where you see the positive stress. This is a brief increase in heart rate and blood pressure, a mild elevation in your stress hormones, and it's, it's something that we need to get things going. Think of um, studying for a test or getting ready to participate in a playoff game. It's a normal physiological response. In the middle, we have our tolerable stress in yellow. Again, we see that brief increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, examples of this include the death of a grandparent or being involved in a car accident. Your body is equipped to handle these tolerable stressors and you have these buffering, supportive adult relationships to get you through. On the far end is the toxic stress response, and that's that prolonged, frequent adversity where you have that high elevation, you know, stress hormones, that increased blood pressure, the increased heart rate, and this is ongoing. You don't have buffering relationships to get you through it, and these examples include abuse, neglect, a caregiver with a substance abuse disorder, or a mental illness. This oftentimes should sound like the adverse childhood experiences that we just reviewed. And that's because what makes toxic stress, particular toxic compared to those other stressors, is that prolonged activation of your stress response system, again, in, with the absence of those protective relationships or those buffers to get you through this hard time. The question for us is what does trauma look like in children? Many of us don't always recognize trauma in children because the manifestation can be quite variable. In medical school, we might have learned about the soldier returning from war with the stereotypical symptoms of PTSD. But for kids, the trauma response might be detachment. And maybe that child with uh, frequent tantrums who shows aggression, exaggeration, edge. And some kids or adolescents may already com be committing actions leading them to involvement with law enforcement. What we do know is that the physiological responses to stress are well-defined. Toxic stress triggers potentially permanent changes through several mechanisms. What we'll look at one by one is the neurobiological effects, the endocrine and metabolic systems, the immune system, and all the way down to epigenetics. 
So let us start with the neurobiology of trauma. The most extensively studied system involves activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical axis and the sympathetic nervous system. Together, these result in increased levels of stress hormones. The ones that we know the best are norepinephrine, adrenaline, cortisol. Whereas transient increase in these stress hormones are protective and even essential for survival, excessively high levels or prolonged exposures can be quite harmful or frankly toxic and the dysregulation of this network of physiological responses is what leads us to that toxic stress response. The analogy that's often used to understand stress is that of being exposed to a tiger. So our body is equipped to handle danger in front of us, be it the tiger. We have the adrenaline and the cortisol from our stress, from our stress response system to help us run or fight the tiger. That's your fight or flight response. The duration of the threat is short. Once that danger or that tiger is, is out of your view, out of sight, you're in a safe place now, your body returns to homeostasis. But what happens when the tiger the threat, the stressor, the trauma is in your life and is present every day. Well, what happens is that we lose that negative feedback. We all learned about the fight or flight or even the freeze response to threat in medical school. That when the brain perceives danger, the HPA axis activates a, normal, a neural hormonal stress response that involves both the sympathetic nervous system and the release of cortisol. Our blood pressure and heart rate goes up, blood flow to our muscles increases, and that system design is designed to deal with that stress short term. The feedback loop ensures that things turn off when we don't need it anymore. However, when you're exposed to chronic adversity, to chronic stress, when that tiger is always in your life, that negative feedback loop is lost and that stress response is ever present. And that is when we get to trauma. Let's review that definition of trauma. This is individual trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. When we look at different parts of our brain anatomy that's impacted by stress, we'll start off with the amygdala. The amygdala is a part of the limbic system and processes fearful and threatening stimuli. The input it receives is integrated into emotions. In other words, it is where emotions are given meaning. It drives that fight or flight response. Here, we'll equate the amygdala to your brain's alarm system. When you are constantly exposed to threat, to danger, to trauma before you, that amygdala is on high alert. Think of it as your brain's alarm system always on, ringing off the hook, alerting you that there is danger nearby. The next area we'll look at is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the interface between the cortex and the lower brain areas. Its major role is in memory and learning. Here we'll think of the hippocampus as your brain's filing cabinet or search engine. When you think about this thinking and learning part of the brain, you need to be safe in order for it to work. So if you think about being exposed to that tiger at that danger, your hippocampus isn't going to be prioritized at this time because you don't have time to go through your filing cabinet or your search engine to figure out, you know, is that tiger an Asian tiger? Is it an African tiger? Is it endangered? Is it trained, right? You, you don't have the safety or the capacity to do that. The next area we'll look at is the prefrontal cortex. And the role of the prefrontal cortex is in the development of executive functions, such as decision-making, working memory, behavioral self-regulation, and mood and impulse control. What's important is that these functions, these higher brain functions take time and safety and you having the capacity to execute these functions. When you're exposed to that danger in front of you, you don't have the time, the space, the capacity or safety to do this. So when faced with chronic adversity, the prefrontal cortex also goes offline. In the image, you'll see the amygdala again, but remember that the amygdala is a deeper brain structure and part of the limbic system. The last area we'll look at is the reticular activating system, or the RAS, and this participates in the fight or flight response as well. 
The RAS plays a major role in arousal, anxiety, and the modulation of limbic and cortical processing. When you think about being in danger, you're not in a safe space to sleep. So this reticular activating system uh, keeps you from falling asleep, uh, you have difficulty staying asleep, nightmares, and this all stems from that activation of the RAS. So when we put all this together, we take that amygdala, your alarm system that's on, alerting you to danger nearby. You have your hippocampus, that search engine, that learning and thinking brain offline. You have that prefrontal cortex, again, in charge of executive functioning. Well, that's offline, and your reticular activating system is keeping you awake. Well, that's how we, dis we figure out what happens to a child who's exposed to chronic stress. To answer that question, so what does trauma look like in children? Well, we put all that together, and this table here helps us understand what the trauma response looks like depending on the age and the developmental age of that child. So if we start off with that infant, toddler, or the preschooler, and we think back on the impact on working memory, on inhibitory control, and on executive function, it sort of makes sense what we see for a child who's been exposed to chronic stress in this sense. You have a child who may have difficulty acquiring those developmental milestones because their thinking and learning brain is offline. They may be showing aggression with other children, throwing temper tantrums. Their attachments might be impacted. They may seem as if they're getting easily frustrated. When you have that school-age child, you have another setting that can provide you additional data. You have teachers who are able to report on what happens to them at school. What happens there is that, again, they may have difficulty acquiring their school-based tasks. They may have trouble um, working with peers in school, keeping up with other children on the playground. Their behaviors may be perceived as a learning disability. Some of their hyperactivity and inattentiveness may be misinterpreted as them having ADHD. For some kids, because that thinking and learning brain is lost and they have trouble uh, keeping up with their memory, but they have adults in their lives that keep asking them what's happened, what happened, you may see them trying to fill in the gaps in their memory and that's when it gets misinterpreted as them lying. The same is true for adolescents. Again, their filling in the gaps in their memory may be misperceived as an integrity issue. They may be having trouble with school, they may already start getting in trouble with the law. And some of the tasks that are important for them to make that transition from adolescence to adulthood is impaired. They may have trouble keeping a part-time job. They may have trouble holding on to a license and getting in trouble while driving. This chart helps us understand how the trauma response looks different across the different ages. These are additional symptoms and manifestations um, about how trauma may look like across the different ages. We have this here for you to use and as an additional resource. All in all, the cost of inaction in adulthood is that you have these health and behavioral issues that span across all the ages. While we advocate for screening for adverse childhood experiences in the doctor's office, the impact of ACEs can be seen in the classroom, on the street, in our jails, and on the news. Looking at this, you could see that from that infant, that toddler, to the school-aged child, all the way to adulthood, you see those comorbidities like obesity, uh, cardiovascular disease. All of these start early on and progress all through the lifespan. So in the face of that tiger always being in the home, we have a child who's living in constant threat. And what becomes prioritized are that, those skills of survival, that limbic system and those skills that are dependent on attachment and safety, that thinking and learning brain, that executive function, well, those belong to the higher area of the brain, the cortex, and that becomes deprioritized at the expense of keeping those skills of survival going. Next, we'll look at the endocrine and metabolic systems, another area that's impacted by toxic stress. The impact on the endocrine and metabolic systems first involves us having an understanding of the metabolic syndrome. The metabolic syndrome describes a clustering of health conditions, including high blood pressure, high fasting blood sugar, insulin resistance, excessive abdominal fat, abdominal cholesterol, or abnormal triglyceride levels. This is more likely to occur in people who have experienced adversity during childhood. 
To understand the impact of the endocrine and metabolic systems, we first looked at the role of leptin. Leptin is released in the acute stress response. It gives you that feeling of being full. And this makes sense because during that fight or flight mode, you're not so much thinking ahead to your next meal. Leptin released in prolonged stress can lead to leptin resistance, resulting in you not feeling full, therefore resulting in you overeating and down the line overweight and obesity. Other factors that are impacted with that prolonged stress response includes um, impaired glucose metabolism, decreased production of insulin, whole body insulin resistance, and there's additional pathways too, including the role of cortisol in increased adip adipose tissue and dysregulation of your glucose metabolism. The next area we'll look at is how toxic stress impacts your immune function. With the immune system, it could be overactivated or underactivated. This leads us inc to have increased vulnerability to infection, inflammation, or autoimmunity. Infections such as the common cold and the inflammatory diseases such as arthritis, asthma, food and seasonal allergies, eczema, emphysema, bronchitis. When you are in a chronic pro-inflammatory state, we see there are increased biomarkers of chronic inflammation, including C-reactive protein, certain interleukins, um, other inflammatory pathways. And again, you have the risk of those autoimmune conditions like arthritis, asthma, allergies, and eczema. One thing that we've also seen is that there is a key risk factor for depression, especially when we know that there is, some, there is a small subset of depression that has an inflammatory component as well. Now let's move on to our last physiological entity, that of epigenetics. Toxic stress can trigger potentially permanent changes in this area as well. Epigenetics investigates the molecular biological mechanisms that affect gene expression without altering DNA sequence. It's important to know that DNA itself is not changing, but more so how it's read and transcribed. Epigenetics challenges us to look beyond genetic predisposition to examine how environmental influences and early experiences affect when, how, and to what degree different genes are actually activated. We know a little bit about this based on animal studies. From the image below, what you'll see is that a pup that is raised by an anxious, low nurturing mother grows up to be the same. And a pup that is raised by a relaxed, high nurturing mother grows up to be similar to that mother. And that's sort of expected from what we know about nature. But if you take that pup that was raised by an anxious, low nurturing mother and allow that relaxed, high nurturing mother to take care of it, that pup actually has the potential to grow up to be relaxed and high nurturing too. This nurturing, this role of epigenetics, helps us understand how pups can learn how to respond to stress and how that role of nurture can also change what we know from the nature side of things. The bottom line to all this, when we talk about toxic stress and its impact on all the organ systems, including your neurobiology, your endocrine and metabolic, your immune system, and the epigenetics, is that significant adversity increases the risk for poor health outcomes throughout life. The physiological disruptions persist into adulthood and may lead to frank disease, even in the absence of later health-threatening behaviors. And in the area of physical health, increased inflammatory mediators and markers can lead to an increase in autoimmune disorders, cancers, uh, cardiometabolic disorders, when changes in leptin, ghrelin, lipid, and glucose metabolism can lead to an increased risk of being overweight, uh, obese, to having insulin resistance, and the list goes on and on, as you can see from this table. From all that we've gone through, we know that the trauma response is physiological. It's adaptive and protective when in threatening situations. However, those same bodily functions and behaviors may be maladaptive when that child is removed from the stressor. Maladaptive when that child. And when it's not examined within the context of past traumas, they can be misinterpreted as pathologic. 
It's not so much about what's wrong with you, but instead what's happened to you and understanding to what are the events and the circumstances that have led the child to where they are now. When we think about children, we oftentimes think about how resilient they are, and that's really one of the, the strengths that they carry. From the AAP's Pediatric Approach to Trauma, Treatment, and Resilience course, we have this mnemonic to help us remember those skills of resilience. We call it the threads. These threads are that thinking and learning brain, thinking back to that hippocampus, uh, hope, their regulation or self-control, their efficacy, their attachment, their developmental skill mastery, their social connectedness. Again, these are the skills that are dependent on having safe, stable, nurturing relationships, having that safety. But when that child is frayed, these are the symptoms of trauma that we try to remember. These are the fits, the frets and fear, the restricted development, the attachment concerns, the yelling and yawning, the educational delays, being defeated, dissociated, this helps us remember the trauma symptoms from that chart earlier on when we looked at how does trauma manifest across the different ages. We do recognize that this only covers most of the behavioral symptoms and not so much the endocrine, metabolic, immune, and epigenetic response. This is to acknowledge that material borrowed from the AAP Patter course is from an educational grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, we thank you for joining us today. Uh, if there's any questions, feel free to contact uh, the information provided below. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Thang, for that informative presentation. I will just uh, take a few minutes to, uh, um, not a few minutes, just whatever it takes to read what's on the screen right now. This is very important about how to get certified to screen for ACEs. The um, clinical team members who bill Medi-Cal must complete a certified ACEs aware core training and attest to completing the training to qualify to receive Medi-Cal payments for conducting ACEs screening. This is the Becoming ACEs Aware in California training. This is a free two-hour online training that certifies eligible clinicians to receive medical payments for ACEs screenings. Clinicians and clinical team members will receive two CME credits and two credits for maintenance of certification, the MOC, upon completion, and are encouraged to join the ACEs Aware clinician directory. All this information is on the ACES Aware Ventura County website. Um, also, we will now start the Q&A portion of this presentation. You are all encouraged to submit questions via the chat box for Dr. Thang to answer during this time, or you may use the raise your hand function and we'll call on you and have you unmute yourself. You may also continue to type your questions in the chat box as we go along. We will first share a few of Dr. Thang's responses to some pre-submitted questions. Stay with us. Can you develop resilience without having been exposed to stressors? Great, thank you so much for that question. When we think about resilience, or from what I've learned from being a part of the AAP Patter course, is that a lot that we know about resilience is from Dr. Ann Matson, who describes resilience so aptly as uh, ordinary magic. And when we think of it as this ordinary magic, it's something that's dynamic and has the potential to change over time. So it's not something that you're either born with or without, but you have that potential for, and it's developmental, and because it can change over the time, you, it's not so much about being born with or without it, but really how do you adapt to the adversity in your life over time? So even if you don't have any adversity to report, you still have the potential for it. How can we initiate a conversation with our patients about difficult topics or experiences with the hope to eliminate or decrease toxic stress? When we think about uh, 
talking about toxic stress with our patients, it's not so much about identifying the specific traumatic experience or that specific adverse childhood experience per se. It's more about identifying the risk factors and in the same token, identifying those resilience factors that they have. A question that I've learned is in surveying for toxic stress exposures, something, something as simple as asking, hey, since the last time I saw you, has anything upsetting or uh, scary happened? And you'll be surprised about what you may receive as your answer from the parents to how the child responds themselves. It's a non-threatening question, and I've, I've had medical students and trainees in the clinic also receive positive response when they ask that of their families. If you don't intervene at an early age, are there still opportunities to address the physical and or psychological effects of ACEs? Thank you for that question. I think that there are still opportunities, even if you don't intervene at an early age. Uh, we know that your skills of resilience are all throughout the lifespan, and it's really about uh, having those safe, stable, nurturing relationships, those buffers in place so that when toxic stress does occur, it falls more in the realm of your tolerable stressors and something that you can overcome. Does vicarious trauma have the same physiological impacts on health? What are some of the physical manifestations of vicarious trauma and how can physicians learn to recognize those symptoms before they become a problem? That's a good question, especially when we consider um, our, both our clinical and non-clinical staff. Right? So when we think about vicarious trauma, there are physical manifestations that will look a lot like your toxic stress response. Those symptoms may be um, feeling dissatisfied at work, being on edge, um, responding abruptly when you normally wouldn't. And, and that's sort of the descriptions that we use for the toxic stress response. Uh, being able to recognize that early is important but it's also working from the top down and having systems in place to make sure that it's a safe work environment for everyone who's involved. In discussing the impact of toxic stress on epigenetics, can genes that have potentially been activated by toxic stress also have the potential to be deactivated by nurturing, caring relationships? Uh, that is a good question. I have to admit that I am not an expert in epigenetics, but theoretically, I think that if you have nurturing, caring relationships, you do. there is a potential that it may alter your gene expression as well, but um, I would defer to someone who is an epigenetics expert. Well, thank you, Dr. Thang. For those responses, we will now start the interactive Q&A portion of this presentation. You may continue to submit questions via the chat box to Dr. Thang, or you can actually use the raise your hand function. We'll be keeping an eye, and um, that way we can ask you to unmute yourself so you can ask your question directly. So let's get started. Let's see. Let me look at the chat box. Hello, Dr. Thang. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. So we have one question already uh, in the chat box from Ayana Hampton. It says, if DCFS is unable to intervene when a child may be experiencing ACEs and trauma, and can't access trauma-informed health provider, where can a child find safety? I think it's tough when you're thinking about adverse childhood experiences, because really the core of that, when you think of those household challenges, is that the individuals in that child's life, the caretakers, right, their parents who are the ones providing them that safety are the ones that are causing that toxic stress response. So I think the whole reason perhaps for this case why DCFS was consulted is probably concerning for the safety of the child. 
I think if it's deemed that the, the household is safe, right? Maybe the, the caretakers aren't the, the, the culprits to this problem, then really using those, those parents or the other attachment figures in this, in this child's life to provide that safe, stable, nurturing relationship, to be that buffer for whatever that, that traumatic experience might be. I think that oftentimes we think of uh, trauma-informed health providers as, as solely uh, mental health providers, but there are other individuals in the community. And I would actually ask for anyone else in this audience, sort of when we're thinking about um, networks of care, if, if they're able to, to provide um, community resources locally um, here. So I just see a very active chat box. So curious if, if anyone has perhaps um, Ventura specific resources. But I really tap into the, the parents and the family members who are able to set up um, a reassurance of safety for the child, to uh, restore routines for them, to act and help them in their regulation of their emotions, right? Those are some of the tenets from Dr. Slaji's first session on, on helping um, practice trauma-informed care. If anybody wants to contribute, you can just unmute your microphone and speak. And by the way, the, the question that came in from Ayana Hampton, uh, Ayana is a mother, child advocate, and educator. Thank you for being with us tonight. Yeah, thank you for your question. I'm not seeing any hands raised. I'm hoping to see, be looking at the correct screen. One question that I see is, um, how would you recommend providers who are interested in getting started screening their patients or clients, but are worried about opening Pandora's box and doing so? And this is a question that many practicing physicians, um, there are many editorials, many commentaries that share this similar question. I think national surveys have said that parents do look to their pediatricians, do look to their primary providers, to open that door and to open that question because sometimes families might not know where to turn. Sometimes starting with their primary care is important. So really reassuring providers of that. And the other thing is when we, when we worry about opening Pandora's box or we worry about going down this rabbit hole, I think at the end of the day, someone is going to have to do that, right? Someone is going to have to open that box. Someone is going to have to go down that rabbit hole because either at this encounter or a subsequent encounter, it's going to come up. And a lot of the concerns and the issues, or the chronic problems that we see, right, there's, there's usually something that's under underlying all of it. And I think when you're able to establish that care, it, it really makes the care you provide, I think, feel more fruitful. Um, may help to do your job. There was that question about vicarious trauma and, and burnout, right? So all these things are, are protective for that too. Anybody else? I just had a quick comment and just wondering, well, first, thank you, Dr. Thang, for your presentation. Um, I was in Ventura County uh, last year as a school psychologist in Simi Valley. Now I'm at the UC Davis Mine Institute in Northern California completing a postdoc. Um, but one thing in the medical field, do you ever find yourself recommending some tools that parents can use on their phone? One, one being the, the Vroom, V-R-O-O-M app, where it helps parents use some skills to you know, practice verbatim on what things they should be saying to kids to promote language development, healthy development, um, and seeing how does that work, or are there any other tools that you recommend? Because I know that's something I try to promote with parents and give, leaving, having them leave with one thing that they can practice or try, um, hopefully that could make a difference. 
Yeah, I think that's great. And I really enjoy these sessions because I learn so much from everyone here, like yourself included about these resources. I think the room I've seen, um, that's also highly promoted. If anyone here uses the Mount Sinai Keystone curriculum, you can um, sign up for that. There are parent handouts from zero to five. So all the, the months from zero to 24 months and then the three, four and five years of age. Um, I thought of that because one of the one of the recommendations on those handouts is also the room, and that's that's how I learned about it. Uh, I think that the CDC, uh, the milestone tracker, is a great one for parents because it also includes things that you can do to promote that child's milestones, right? And we know that developmental delay could also be a sign of, of something that's going on, right? So a speech delay, a gross motor delay. So that one is really helpful. I think that we oftentimes forget about Sesame Street communities. That has tons of resources. And, you know, even though we say that we, we don't want kids to be, you know, engaged in a lot of screen time, but if they are working with their parents and engaged with their parents on that, and you pull that up while you're, you know, you have the electronic medical record on one side and you pull up Sesame Street communities on the other side, you're really able to show them that, you know, when, um, when Big Bird needs to take his breath to calm down, right? When Elmo is upset, what that looks like it really um, helps the families as well too. I will say that the more challenging resource to look for is for the older children. So I'm curious if anyone here has things for uh, the adolescents. Um, I know that for families who have Netflix account, a lot of the meditation applications are now integrated into Netflix. A lot of communities are also offering headspace through the schools. I think that a lot of the teenagers are, are receptive to that. Um, but I, I will say for the adolescents, it's a little bit harder to find some resources for them. Thank you. I want to point out that in the chat box, there is the link for the information for the Vroom app that you can click on to learn more about it. There's a question from Veronica Martinez. Besides ACES questionnaires, are there any evidence-based trauma-informed assessment tools you would recommend for providers? In particular, I'm seeking a biopsychosocial assessment tool. Thank you, Veronica. Um, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but I know that whenever I'm looking for uh, an assessment tool, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, has a repertoire of all these different screeners and forms that you're able to use and download. Much of them you don't need a, a, a membership for at all. I will look, look for it or um, one of our Ventura County ACES aware um, staffers may be able to find it, but I know that the AP has a, it's a big page of all these different assessments that you're able to download. So like the ages and stages questionnaire is on it, your M chats, and then including um, anxiety and, and depression screeners are all on there as well too. There's a question. Uh, can you share a little bit more about the different levels of risk for toxic stress as it relates to the ACEs score? I think the ACEs score goes by if you um, have some stressors in your life, if you're demonstrating some of those uh, ACE related conditions. I think at the end of the day, we, we know that the ACE questionnaire really stems from a, a population based study. And for the individuals who do have some of those items, but they're otherwise doing pretty well, you know, I think that's really important to, to reinforce those protective factors, those resilience factors, those, those strengths that they have. Um, and then in terms of the, the ones who, who are showing um, some symptoms, right, to be able to connect them with the, the proper referrals or resources and also still strengthening what's happening in the family at the same time. So Nisa Seals is a youth and family wellness facilitator and teaches nurturing parenting classes in the curriculum. They touch a little bit about childhood experiences from a trauma-informed approach. However, as facilitators, they're not trained clinicians. Do you have any advice on how they can best handle and support parents 
who may have had ACEs traumas during their childhood within the classroom space? That's a good question. Um, I, I think that in just like we try to uh, weave the threads, right, that mnemonic for the children, I think in the same token, we want to do that for our parents too, right? The, the whole um, trauma-informed care, you know, one of the key principles is safety. And another one is we're not trying to re-traumatize. So I don't think it's, we need to get into the nitty gritty of what the specific traumatic stressor or event could be to avoid that re-traumatization, but some of those validating measures, right? And supporting their efficacy, letting these parents know what they're doing well and identifying some of the strengths in their, in their children, right? Like you did that and, and supporting them because I think parents of all different up brings and backgrounds, I think you hear more of what you are doing wrong than what you're doing right. And oftentimes that's, you know, as you're leading the, the parenting class, you probably also will speak to that children hear a lot more of what they are doing wrong than what they are doing right as well. Um, so I think to best handle support our parents is offering them some validation. Um, letting them know that what they are doing right. And even the small things that they are doing to let the child know that they're there to foster that secure attachment, how important it is for that um, child's development. Uh, Nisa, yeah, as, wanna... you, as, you, as you introduce your, your parenting class, I wonder if you're able to tell people how to refer families there. It sounds like a, a great resource. So here's a question from, well, first I want to acknowledge uh, Wendy, thank you for putting in the, uh, the information about the curriculum in Sacramento County. If anybody wants to look at that, it's in the chat box. Uh, Megan Kenny, thanks you for the presentation. And do you have any recommendations or specific words of encouragement for providers who may have completed the ACES Award training, but are hesitant to start screening for ACES? I think that hesitancy is um, shared by many practices. And I think the first step is having a trauma-informed care organization, right? Working with everyone where you're practicing and then thinking about um, everyone that comes into contact with that patient too, right? The encounter isn't solely in the exam room. It starts from, you know, when they walk into the door, when they check in, when your medical assistants or nurses um, interact with that patient to do their vitals. And then when the physician interacts with them, and then when the ancillary staff comes in to complete those orders, really getting everyone um, aware, I think it's really important. I think it's nice that to have the ACEs Aware training be uh, available to all practitioners. So um, physicians and licensed vocational nurses, registered nurses to everyone else who might be interacting with the family. And it's, it's not, you know, right off the bat, it's going to run smoothly, but I think being a part of these um, community groups and networks of care, being able to um, share ideas and see what's worked, what has other groups is really informative as well too. But the, at the end of the day, it may not be so much in terms of identifying their particular event or experience, right? Because even something as simple as starting to survey and asking, you know, has anything um, scary or upsetting happened, right? Like let's Let's think more about this together. Whenever I think about the, the trauma-informed care principles, right? Having that safety, getting the trust, right? Having transparency in the conversation. Those are all important as well, too. Uh, two things. I want to acknowledge uh, Nisa. Uh, thanks you again and put some information about her Reach Out and Read program in uh, Upland, California. So you can look at that. And also Ayana Hampton has her hand raised. If you would like to unmute yourself and and uh, and come on, that would be sure. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say that this is incredibly informative, and I'm extremely grateful that this is open to non-certified um, peeps like myself. Um, 
Um, and I'm curious is to follow up with um, the network of the community here and with um, Dr. Tang. Do um, in the event that there's a high conflict co-parented household, um, what could the path look like for those parents when there's discord and perhaps one parent is unable to provide that the routine and the, the care and the security and the safety, those, those components that are critical, what if it's really one-sided and how can we, um, yeah, is there a path to get a, adults on the same page to, uh, to, to develop a, as, as, po as much as possible, like a balanced, safe <laughs> child? Yeah, I think I think oftentimes that's when we um, will focus on the priority of the child, right? Sort of putting aside our differences and seeing where we come to have that safe space for the child. Right? We know how important routines are, so the the routine might not have to look the same at both locations, but what routine can there be, right? So when I think it's all about setting the expectations for that child, right? When I'm here, this is sort of the routine I would expect, but at least there is a routine. And when I'm there, with, even if the routines are exactly the same and other things like reassurance of, of like safety for the child can look like when they go to bed, having a photo of that parent who's not at that home, you know, at that, at that parent's home and the other parent a photo in their home, little things like that. I think that in the chat box, you have some parenting resources to be able to go to together. Uh, in the same token, uh, most of the trauma-informed, or actually all of them, I would say, the trauma-informed evidence-based therapies, they're, they're not individual therapies for the child, right? Oftentimes, these are, these are families, these are dyadic. Um, the entire family is, is in attendance. So I think that's important to remember, too, should, should that be um, what the family needs. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. I do not see any more hands raised. If anybody um, has any other questions, you could uh, unmute yourself. I'll give it a few seconds. Yeah, and even if you don't have questions, these resources are great. So I hope that we can, we can share them out with everyone. Well, seeing none, let me see again. Yes, I don't see any. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thang, for all these thoughtful responses. Um, is there anything else that you want to add before we close? I just want to thank everyone for attending tonight. Thank you all for participating. And thank you to this amazing team for executing this. It's been fantastic. Have a you good know, night, we, everyone. You know, we do, we have just uh, like one minute left and there's a wonderful question. So can we, can toxic stress during pregnancy harm the fetus? I don't know specifically about the toxic stress in terms of uh, biological changes. I do know a lot of the researchers, even, even one of my um, faculty here at UCLA, do know that a lot of that maternal upbringing does have an impact on, on the pregnancy. And so when we think about uh, uh, premature or preterm um, deliveries, right? That's, that's all from, from stress. So I will say that, you know, when we have that lifespan, we should really include even from the preconception um, onward as part of, part of the concerns. Well, thank you, Dr. Thang. And with that, we are gonna close. And I wanna thank everyone for attending. And I hope you feel better informed on how to address ACEs and the toxic stress re response in your practice and settings. Please stay for some uh, important reminders from the Landon Pediatric Foundation ACEs grant coordinators. Thank you. Thank you again for watching this lecture. Remember to complete the registration and evaluation. We will contact you soon if you are one of our raffle winners, so stay tuned.
make sure to follow us on all our social media accounts and subscribe on our webpage for more information of our 12 lecture series, ACES Aware Ventura County and all things ACES Aware. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Bye. Bye. See, See you at our next session. session. Thank you everybody for joining tonight. Um, again, these are just a few reminders. Um, we have our registration link as well as our evaluation link. So please uh, remember to complete those. We'll also send a follow-up email with those links as well. Um, and feel free to visit our website to register for our upcoming sessions. Um, and again, thank you for joining and have a great night.